Uh, this is a joint uh, program uh, being organized by ECC, our uh, uh, partners in such programs, and uh, Atashree. So on behalf of both ECC and Atashree, I'd like to welcome Dr. Govind Rao to this uh, program. And uh, I'm so grateful that he has been able to accept our invitation at very short notice. For that, I'm really indebted to Dr. Krishna, who's our own Atashrian, a very distinguished economist who has only recently moved into Atashri. I'm so happy and so proud of the fact that Dr. Krishna is now one of us and will be helping us in similar programs. I have already circulated Dr. Goindrao's bioscript, so I should not go over it. We'll take it as read. But I'd like to highlight the fact that as the uh, director of the National Institute of Public Finance and Policy, which is an autonomous uh, research body of the Ministry of Finance, he and his team under his leadership have done a tremendous amount of research on tax policy and administration, on public expenditure and subsidies, on government debt, fiscal federalism, rural and urban economics. And these, this research and his own contribution have made a tremendous impact on public policy making and thinking on public policy, which has obviously affected the budget making exercises in for several years now. So that is something which he has brought with him uh, and that wisdom he has taken to many other institutions. He's currently associated with the Indian Institute of Management Bangalore uh, and is an advisor to them for the Center for Public Policy and also with the Takshila Foundation. Uh, he's been, uh, I won't go into a whole lot of things which are not in the bioscript that I've given. The bioscript hardly reflects his achievements or his contribution in various fields. The publications, the books, and uh, the talks that he has given. Uh, I shall not go over that because that would take up much more time than one we can uh, possibly permit today. Uh, I would therefore request Dr. Govindra to start off without further ceremony on the budget. This budget, which we all look upon as something different from what we've had in the last two or three years, something which we look upon with a certain amount of hope, uh, hope for uh, recovery, hope for growth. And it's in that context that we as laymen would like to hear from him uh, an analysis of the budget what it means for us. Dr. Goenzra. Uh, let me mute everyone except the speaker. I'd, I'd request Mindro to do that. And uh, I would also request everyone to use the chat box. Uh, please feel free to type out your uh, questions, your comments in the chat box as we go along. Yes, Thank sir. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raja. Uh, for uh, those very generous uh, words. Um, I'm uh, most grateful to Professor K.L. Krishna um, and uh, you for inviting me to um, deliver this lecture at uh, Arthashri. Um, you know, Professor Krishna is someone who, you know, who has always been a person we all look forward to for guidance. He has been a teacher's teacher, I should say. Um, we have all learned a great deal of things. In fact, um, you know, I my first encounter with him was um, when I was an advisor to the Ninth Finance Commission, and I was trying to use some um, some econometric uh, techniques, and I couldn't find anybody else, you know, to, better than him to go to. So I I had not we had not met earlier. I straight away went to him and then requested him to help. And it was a great, you know, from then on, it has been a great, um, you know, I always look forward to him for uh, guidance. Um, so I'm 
I'm most grateful to be speaking to you all, um, you know, uh, particularly um, interacting with you, with uh, Professor Krishna and all the rest of you. Um, as I mentioned, I would like to speak on the budget, um, but more in terms of the conversation, uh, because there may be a lot of things that I might get from you in the process um, of my talk. In the, you know, what I'll do is after a brief introduction about the economic environment uh, it, in which we had the budget was presented, then I will go into very briefly on the, uh, on some discussion on the economic survey. And then I'll come to the budget proper. Um, the economy has been very severely hit after the lockdown. Now, in fact, uh, the first half of the year has shown a contraction in the economy of the order of somewhere about 17%. Now, and in the first quarter, the, the contraction was almost 23, I mean, it was 23.9%. The, the, the possibly we have had the most severe lockdown as compared to any other country in the world. And for virtually for two months, there was no economic activity that was happening whatsoever. And then obviously gradual, you know, sort of lifting of the, the restrictions with that gradual resumption of economic activities. I mean, it was, you know, it was a human tragedy in many ways with the migrant laborers, with no public transport available, walking back to their, uh, to their, to their modes. Now, so obviously economy has been in a pretty bad shape and the expected contraction in the economy for the year as given by the advanced estimate of GDP last month by the Central Statistical Organization is 7.7%. Now, it's not, the, the contraction on account of uh, pandemic is one thing, but the economy in general has been slowing down. The in fact, the growth rate in the economy had slowed down from 8% in the last quarter of 2017-18. Yeah, 2017-18, it has been gradually slowing down and actually in the last quarter of last year, that means 2019-20, the growth rate, growth rate was just 3.1% which is possibly one of the lowest that was seen in recent times. The investments have been declining. Um, in fact, in 2017-18, investment rate was somewhere about 32%. It has declined to uh, somewhere 28-29%. Now, there have been several reasons for this. One is what... Um, Arvin Subramanian, in his, when he was the chief economic advisor, called uh, the twin balance sheet crisis, where um, the balance sheets of the commercial banks have been completely overtaken, you know, com completely sort of um, uh, affected by the, the non-performing assets. And um, the balance sheets of the corporates have not, have, you know, sort of, uh, have not, had not been doing well. In fact, corporates have not been borrowing and then the bankers are not lending. And um, the, I mean, the, uh, the, the fiscal st financial stability report of the Reserve Bank of India basically said that the, after the pandemic, particularly the, the non-performing assets of the, the, the scheduled commercial banks is um, uh, supposed to decline from 13.5% to 14.8% you know, 14, 14 by September of 22. And the decline, uh, the sharp decline in the public sector banks, uh, um, the non-performing assets, is from 16.6% uh, to 17.6%. That means that by September 22, almost 17.6% of, the, of the, the loans that they have given 
are likely to you know go so they have not not likely to return that's that's the sort of a situation that uh, um, we have been in and particularly because of the pandemic the various regulatory uh, forbearances that have been given the moratorium and restructuring and all you know sort of things that have been given um, they are likely to really affect the 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 businesses will badly there can be a spate of bankruptcies as we go along and there may be a lot more of um, um, non performing assets accumulating what my good friend urjit patel says uh, kicking the can down the road uh, through various these regulatory perform performances or extending and pretending saying that you know sort of that there is no problem you know if you you know is not going to help matters now bank credits have been slowing down it is in this environment obviously the the budget was presented and um, obviously you know there is a lot of rhetoric always whenever the budget is presented i'll not going to this thing saying that oh the budget rests on six pillars health and well being physical and social infrastructure one of the things before i go in to the some discussion on the economic survey i want to say that some or other you know the whole country wakes up to the central union budget not you know not realizing the fact that the, the actual expenditure incurred at the, the at the central government level is 30% 70% of the expenditure is actually you know implemented at the state level obviously states get something like you know sort of 20% through centrally sponsored schemes Uh, which is a, a discretionary grant given by the government, and then there is generally uh, the tax devolution and grants, which is given through a constitutional mechanism. But in terms of spending, almost eighty-five percent of the spending on healthcare is implemented at the state level. Almost seventy-five to eighty percent of the education expenditure is incurred at the state level. But then there is a lot of euphoria when. Uh, and then even when the state center say that oh we increase the the uh, expenditure on health by so much so, so many percentages you know actually it doesn't you know in terms of the aggregate the the impact is not very large now let me very briefly come to the economic survey the economic survey actually makes an impassioned plea for increased government expenditure um it says that you know sort of government should spend more when the when it is in the lower part of the economic cycle you need to really have a counter cyclical policy which basically means when the economic economy is slowing down the government expenditure should increase and we, when the economy is booming then obviously the government should uh, should con contract its expenditure so it says that the counter cyclical fiscal policy is important of course everybody agrees with that and so it then it the it says that debt sustainability should not be a concern because you see i mean this is the time when you should not bother about what what happens to the debt sustainability because there is an equation called the dormer equation which basically says that if your primary deficit is zero that means deficit excluding you know deficit of the government excluding the interest payments if the primary deficit is zero then if the growth rate of the economy is faster than the effective interest rate the government pays then the debt will decline because debt to gdp ratio will decline i mean this is this is a simple arithmetic so we don't really have to go into this but uh, so so it says that even the primary deficit you should not bother about now you should simply go about spending money and um, because your growth rate is uh, higher than the higher than the effective interest rate the government pays you see what is forgotten in this is that you know if you do the financial repression and keep the interest rate low through by by pumping in liquidity if the reserve bank does that now obviously the interest rate is not going to go up because the reserve bank is always there to pump in liquidity so that the yield the stays low and that has its own distortions that it creates 
but in any case i mean you know sort of in, this is the time when obviously the spending has to be done but i mean in other words what i'm trying to say it's not as simple as the economic the chief economic advisor economic survey says but nevertheless he said that the debt sustainability should not be a concern now now and he says growth leads to debt sustainability not the other way around and then borrowing used for investment purposes has a, investment has a high what is what what he calls the the fiscal multiplier that means borrowing you know used for making investment in infrastructure actually helps the helps in um, creating a multiplier effect for the uh, for the private sector so there is a lot of private sector activity that happens if the inter- infrastructure is better so and therefore it should be done and and he goes on to say that the credit rating agencies have been unfair to india and generally to emerging markets and so you should not bother about what the credit rating agencies uh, do and simply go about uh, spending money and growth is the most effective antidote both for uh, poverty and you should not really bother about you know great you know sort of spending i mean you should really focus on the growth growth and growth well this is um, this is i mean we, we can take it this way i mean obviously he is making a, an impassioned plea for uh, you know you sort of spending more i am you know but the fact of the matter is um it's not just the growth growth uh, interest rate differences one has to look at what is happening to the 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 the, the primary deficit as well obviously spending you know spending more on infrastructure is helpful but at the same time you know we should also see that on the revenue expenditures the or the on current expenditures spending should be minimized now let me come to the 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 budget as i mentioned uh, the finance minister said that um, she is placing the budget on six pillars which is health and well being physical and social infrastructure inclusive development reinvigorating human capital innovation and research and development and then she said minimum government and maximum governance i see this more as a sort of a rhetoric i think every budget has to have rhetoric um well there are some discussion that go on but uh, let me let me go into what the budget has delivered um as i said whenever look you know whenever we look at the budget we look we need to look at three important things from the point of view of a common man you know what happens to the taxes what you know, what happens to his you know so for disposable savings etc etc but obviously nobody was expecting any any sort of concessions this time and back to people were people were expecting uh, additional taxes in terms of uh, you know cesses and surcharges for or in earmark levies as they say for you know spending on defense and uh, health care but um, well that has not happened except that there is an additional 1% cess for for um, you know the to strengthening the agricultural infrastructure um of course there are some questions on that um, particularly from the perspective of the states because the money raised through cess doesn't get you know doesn't become a part of the divisible pool with the states i will come to that later now we were all expecting uh, you know we were all you know basically trying to see what has uh, happened during the course of the year in terms of revenue collections because even before the ink was dry the last year's budget had become irrelevant it had become irrelevant for two reasons one is as the control general of accounts finalized the account he found out that the budget had a much you know sort of over the revised estimate for the previous year that in 2018 19 revised estimate makes were you know severely overestimated and as a result the budget estimates which were built on the basis on the base of the revised estimates 
were um, obviously unrealistic. In fact, uh, the budget had estimated for 2018-19 oh, the fiscal deficit of 3.8 percent, but the actual numbers compiled by the Controller General of Accounts said that the fiscal deficit was 4.6 percent. So, but then that was only the beginning. Now, when finally the pandemic struck, the, the, the entire estimates of revenue and expenditure for the year um, became completely unrealistic. Now, as you see that there has been a sharp decline in the revenue, as compared to 2018-19, the estimates of revenue show a, a, a contraction of 7.6%. And as compared to the budget estimates of this, the, the year, that is 2020-21, the, the, as compared to the budget estimates, the, the re revised estimates show a, a lower figure of 23%. The taxes were lowered by somewhere about 17.8% and the non-tax revenues were lowered by almost 45% because dividends from various public enterprises, various other, you know, including the dividends from the Reserve Bank of India were, uh, you know, turned out to be lower. Although they tried to squeeze more from the Reserve Bank of India. Now, on the other hand, Expenditure figure shows an increase of 13.4% from the previous year. And as compared to the budget estimates, expenditure figures are higher by 28.4%. Revenue estimates are higher by 28% and capital expenditures are higher by almost 31%. Now, if one looks at it, all these um, during the course of the year, the, the stimulus that was given was mainly through the Reserve Bank's, um, you know, moratorium, lowering of the interest rates, restructuring, and, and the like. And the, for the budget, not much was given. In fact, uh, the, the fiscal stimulus came from the, coming from the budget was less than, uh, you know, was just about 1% of uh, uh, GDP, or just a little over 2 lakh crores. But, um, but then how did it happen that expenditures have suddenly, you know, sort of increased? This is because I think during the course of the year, when the government saw that the economy was contracting by leaps and bounds by almost 24% in the first quarter, then it decided to start, start on a spending spree, spending spree. In fact, from October onwards, the monthly figures show a sharp increase in both revenue and capital expenditure, uh, you know, that to to help to revive the economy, and that's one. And of course, the thing continues because this uh, the revised estimates are all the way up to end of March this year, and so increase of twenty eight percent as compared to the budget estimate is mainly up in the second half of the year, which basically implies that the growth of GDP that was estimated earlier could turn out to be, in fact, the actual growth could turn out to be better because in the previous uh, part, in the, in the first half of the year, the, the sector called the public administration and defense actually uh, had a growth rate lower, you know, had a uh, growth rate with, which was negative 11%, which means that, you know, that is likely to turn positive and, and then obviously when the government expenditure increases, you know, in a situation where the demand is very low in the economy, it also helps to, you know, increases, you know, sort of helps to increase the, you know, lift the demand up. So there was an allegation that uh, much of the lifting of the problem was done by the Reserve Bank of India, but now it looks that the government has also been doing this, which basically, you know, which is, I'm, I'm not objective to that particular thing, but I think it was necessary. But what has happened as a result is that overall fiscal deficit in the country is estimated for the year at 9.5%. That means 2020-21. Uh, in other words, 9.5% of the total expenditure of the government of India was actually met from borrowed funds. Now, 
there is the government has tried to you know become a little more transparent because what used to happen earlier was that you know for food subsidy you know actually what the food subsidy is food corporation of india purchases food grains procures food grains from the from the farmers and obviously it pays the minimum support price procures the food grains there is um, a transportation cost there is a cost which is incurred in maintenance of the stocks and then obviously it is sold through the public distribution system and at a, at a very low price and the difference between the between this the 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 cost total cost and the 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 money that is realized is the volume of subsidy and government in the last few years what has been doing is it has not been paying it from the from the budget it's been asking the food corporation of india to borrow money from what is called the national small saving fund now this national small saving fund is you and me put the money in the post office saving bank post office back on the nss and post office savings and this is this is put in the national small saving fund and the the the, the fund has a capital there and so the 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 food corporation borrows this money from the fund at a fairly high rate of interest and government of india gives the guarantee and says that it will repay at some point of time so it's basically trying to to you know instead of paying for the budget and show in order to show a lower fiscal deficit they have been doing this obfuscation now what has happened is that i mean we have been saying that you see please come clean let us be transparent let the people know but anyway the the finance minister has decided to come clean so for this year she has made a slightly lower provision and for next year she said that there will not be any borrowing from the national small saving fund so if you add that back into this year's fiscal deficit it works out to 10.1% not 9.5% and the the primary deficit which is a, a crucial uh, this thing for debt uh, uh, dynamics and um, you know without you know with uh, with this additional uh, non, uh, off budget borrowing it works to some close to 6% otherwise it is about 5.5% which basically means that um, you know it's not enough to have I mean, it basically means that the debt is likely to grow this year um, i mean it is already almost close to 90% um, and this 7 point and this 9.5% on you know so fiscal deficit estimated is actually much higher than what the new finance commission also has estimated finance commission estimate estimates that the fiscal deficit would be somewhere about 7.4% incidentally fiscal uh, finance commission is the constitutional commission which is basically appointed every years by the every five years by the president of india uh, you know which makes a recommendation on the amount of money to be trans the tax taxes to be transferred to the states and the grants to be given to the states and there is a 15th finance commission uh, has submitted the recommendation that has you know that its recommendation will be effective from april 1st onwards and that has also given a, a adjustment path how to how to adjust the fiscal um, you know debt and deficits as we go along anyway now what are the macro implications of this budget <coughs> now as i said this year obviously we needed uh, the government to spend more to lift the economy uh, from the situation that we are in and obviously nobody is going to complain about the either the deficits or the debt because the economic revival, revival is more important now now again if you really look at it so budget tells you what has happened in the current year but it also tell you what it is intend what it intends to do in the next year that means 2011 uh, 2021 22 i mean if you look at it next year's expenditure increase is not very large no in fact the increase as compared to the revised estimates of this year is just about a little little just about 1% um, you know that that's all as a percentage of gdp it actually is lower from 17.6 to 15.5% uh, 
um, 15 point, 17 point 7 to 15.6%. You know, in other words, there is not much of a, a public expenditure spending has, you know, that has been existing. Actually, revenue expenditure is lower next year by 2.7%, but the capital expenditure is higher by somewhere about 26%. So, which basically implies that the government intends to contain. Now, how does it, how is, how are they going to finance it? Number one, they have, you know, sort of, um, they have assumed that the nominal growth, not the real growth, nominal growth next year will be somewhere about 14%. The advance estimates said that it will be 14.5%. So in that sense, they are, they are a little more conservative. Nominal growth of the economy will be, you know, of the GDP will be 14.4%, which basically implies that the tax revenues will rise by about 15% next year. And, you know, in the, in the current year, they had initially budgeted for disinvestment, that means selling of public sector uh, enterprises equity of the order of somewhere about 2.1 lakh crore. And the actual realization so far is just about 15,000 crore. But then they think that, you see, this month and the next month, they will be able to ga gather another 15,000 crore. So uh, actually, the total is, as against the budget estimate of two, you know, so 2.1 lakh crore, they are just getting 32,000 crore. So next year, they have budgeted for 1.75 lakh crore. And possibly, they will may be able to get it because there are a number of things which, you know, this year they did not do it because the markets were low and the, the, finance, the, the situation was not very congenial for the selling of the public enterprises, but possibly stock markets are doing much better this year now, and possibly they may be able to do it. And therefore they have talked about, you know, selling of, you know, so privatizing, privatizing many of the enterprises and selling of public sector equity and various other things. So the higher tax revenue because of the, the economic recovery, as well as, um, and higher uh, disinvestment proceeds are the, the, you know, sort of help it. And uh, as a, even with that, you know, you will have a situation where your fiscal deficit will be somewhere, you know, will be, you know, more than 6.5, uh, 6 will be somewhere about 6.8% of GDP which is fairly high, and um, the primary deficit will be 3.5%. So as I mentioned, next year's increase in expenditure is not very large. So they hope that the private sector will start doing things. Disinvestment will, um, will keep, um, you know, so will help to keep the deficit till, you know, to, uh, to some extent. But this even 6.8% that I'm talking about, as compared to the earlier figures, you know, as I said, there was off budget liabilities. There is no off budget liability this year. Well, so which is high, but at the same time, you know, there's something which we cannot evolve. Uh, what is important is the, the in, increase planned in capital expenditure. And I hope they will be able to contain the revenue expenditures and increase the capital expenditure. There is a very significant talk that health expenditure has increased. As I mentioned, much of the health expenditure has to come from the states. Now, what has really happened is that they have made some additional allocation of 35,000 crores for vaccine distribution. And, and then, you know, sort of under, and the Finance Commission had made a recommendation that uh, under the urban, or under the local body grants, a certain amount of money should be earmarked for health health purposes to strengthen the, the primary health centers uh, and sub-centers in rural and urban areas. So, and then what they have also done is, you know, this is the way they have, you know, way they try to confuse. They have also added water supply and sanitation along with the health expenditure and then compared it with the earlier, earlier only health expenditure. So, you know, you see a situation, but if you really carefully see, the expenditure increases from 33,896 crores in the current year to somewhere about 67,468 crores. It's not a very, very large increase. And um, possibly, you know, of the, uh, you know, something like 2 lakh 30,000, 30,000, uh, 2 lakh 40,000 crores, that is the total spending on health expenditure. This is not very large. And much of the health expenditure will have to come from the state budget and we will have to see how they do. Because Constitution and say constitution says 
the health care is a state subject it is not the central subject but however central government gives some grants to the states under what is called the centrally sponsored scheme for for what is a program called national health mission and national health mission in spending plus the additional expenditure that was additional grants that was expected that was given by the that was recommended by the 15th finance commission and on defense actually you know one was thinking that there would be a lot lot more of expenditure but actually there is an it has not increased and, uh, and in fact it is slight the in absolute terms if you take out the defense pensions only the defense expenditure is slightly lower than last year and low, lower than the current year you know current year it is planned at 4 lakh 4.05 4 lakh crore next year it is just about 4.01 lakh crore you know it's almost the same uh, but um, but then you know possibly in the during the course of the year if the need arises the this thing the government one of the things that they have done is again based on the recommendation of the 15th finance commission they have also created a non lapsable fund uh for the the uh, for defense because whenever there is an, a need arises for capital expenditure uh, suddenly they can't go back to the budget so you keep you create a fund and keep it in public accounts see in the budget there are three compartments one is consolidated fund which is basically the basically the thing from where you get the revenues and expenditures and incurred expenditure the second is a public account which is like you know keeping like basically the bank, government doing some sort of a, a banking type of transaction whether it is uh, with various funds um, you know whether it is a national small saving fund which is compi- comprising of the people's contributions uh, for the uh, post office savings and other things or various cesses and surcharges which are given which you know for, which are put in the fund and drawn for spending on you know specific purposes and of course this is the this so this is a, a, a public account and then there is a contingency fund which where you in, in a contingency you take it out and recoup but in any case they have created this fund for the defense non lapsable fund and um, what they intend to do is to monetize the the land uh, monetize the land uh, of the held by the defense department and various other things and put the money in the fund but anyway i mean that was a contentious term of reference given to the finance commission and uh, in fact many people including me have said that you may create a fund but don't reduce the share of the states so expansion is not very large fiscal deficit is 6.8% and the government will have to watch and um, increase in the capital expense in capital expenditures will help and then of course on terms of the federal dim- dimension the you know the additional cess for agriculture infrastructure is you see you know the you know in fact the money that is transferred to the states is called the divisible pool divisible pool comprises of all the the central taxes except the central taxes coming from the various cesses and surcharges once the finance commission gives the recommendation the union government is in the habit of only increasing the cesses and surcharges so that they don't have to share that part, you know particular money you know this is the way to you know so this year in fact if you see state share has been steadily in the in the gross tax revenue of the center has been steadily uh, declining in spite of the the finance commission's recommendations have continued to be the same the so these are broadly the so what what is what is the bottom line the bottom line is that the economy is likely to recover better aggregate demand is not likely to go much much higher in the next year uh, because the aggregate expenditure is not going to go up but at the same time since the capital expenditure is go- going to be higher possibly there will be better multipliers and then economy can recover much faster and so and of course the deficit is continue to be high and the government needs to watch um, but the, since the private sector borrowing is not really uh, commercial borrowing is not really taking off and this is you know sort of there may, may not be serious danger of inflation at this particular moment but then government needs to watch 
Now let me come to the, the whole issue of reforms. There is a, one of the major things that they said is that there will be strategic uh, disinvestment and privatization. And um, obviously, this is something which uh, is, uh, you know, some or the other over the years, we have forgotten what the role of the government should be. The government, the government should come in where the markets fail. And the market failure can be in terms of provision of public basic public services. It can or in terms of, um, you know, sort of uh, ensuring that markets behave well and through regulation. So the nature of intervention should depend upon the nature of market failure. If the markets don't exist, obviously government should come in and then create, create those markets. If there is no sufficient information available and what we call the asymmetric information problem, the government should come and help in disseminating the information. But what has happened is that the government has actually taken over, you know, this is a legacy of the past. Many of the things, you know, whether, it, and then of course, when the technology changes, obviously the markets, you know, the market, in, in, you know, government intervention also will have to change. For example, there was a time when the, the technology did not permit the private sector to come into the telecom market. Now you have the private sector in the telecom market, you have the private sector in the airlines, and you have private sector in, in many other areas. Now, in these cases, the focus of the government should be to ensure that there is a fair competition in the market rather than running airlines. So the, in that sense of the term, the, the decision to privatize Air India, container corporation, uh, container corporation of India, shipping corporation, Bharat Petroleum Limited, Bharat Earth Movers Limited, IDBA Bank, and they're also talking about two commercial banks. Now, um, we'll have to see how this, this entire thing will proceed. And then of course, they are changing the problem, this thing, policy and strategic the disinvestment. Disinvestment means the government will continue to hold the majority share, but then it will also dis, you know, sort of dilute, uh, even while holding the majority share, it will dilute the share. Now, that's, the, that's one of the, the important. The second thing is the introduction of the creation of what is called the asset restructuring company. You know, the bad the loans of the banks have accumulated as a sort of non-performing assets. And the, bank, the banks are unable to lend when you have such a large, the large volume, large percentage of your assets in the bad books. And therefore, this is a restructuring company is created wherein the banks will sell their bad assets to this asset restructuring company. And asset restructuring company, after buying those bad loans, will start you know, recovering the money from the, from, the, from the borrowers. Now, obviously, the banks will have to lose money in the process of selling because, you know, when, when, when now the question is whether the banks will be willing to sell and, where, you know, sort of to at what, they will all have to take a haircut in selling because 100 rupee you know, borrowing may be, may be sold for 20 rupees. Now, how much? And you know, there is always the fear of the, the, the control general of account and control and auditor general, you know, the three C's, they will always come in and then sort of, the, you know, come in. So to what extent the banks will, public sector banks will be willing to do that, we will have to see, but hopefully they will be given sufficient incentive to do that. But then that, so there is a, so that, you know, once you clean up the balance sheet of the banks, the hope is that the public sector bank will start lending to the commercial work. Now, but then there is a basic reason why the banks have accumulated bad assets. Their capacity to, to evaluate, uh, the commercially evaluate the things, the political interference in, in, the, in this matter, what, has, what will be done in order to improve the governance and the capacity of the public sector banks will have to be seen. The second important um, and the, the third important reform that has been put forth is the creation of what another institution called the development financing institution. Now, what is happening now is that the banks get their deposits either by way of saving deposits or term deposits for a short period of you know three years, one year, five years. But for infrastructure financing, 
you know, I mean, those those companies will take will have to borrow for ten years, fifteen years. There is a serious asset liability mismatch, and therefore, you know, in the earlier years they had started, you know, with through refinancing uh, of some part of uh, RBI profits. They had started the um, IDBI, ICICI, IFCI, and companies like that, which were basically supposed to lend for long-term uh, purposes for the infrastructure. Then gradually things didn't work out, and then they were, you know, given bank licenses, and they became banks. Then they created two institutions. One is uh, uh, infrastructure development um, um, finance I, uh, finance corporation, IDFC, and the ILF, ILFS. Now, what in fact that again the things didn't they didn't lend things didn't work out. So IDBA was given a bank license. ILFS has, was a non-banking company, and then that got into all sorts of problems, governance issues, and that has gone bust. Now, so again we are bringing up this development finance institution, and then so that hopefully government has given some twenty thousand crores of seed money, and it hopes that. Um, um, the, they will have a, sort of uh, their ambition is to have something like uh, have a, a portfolio of five lakh crore lending portfolio in three years time and hope that will work. And the third important, fourth important thing is that general insurance they are trying to reduce. They are encouraging the FDI. There is some they have, they have increased the FDI limit from forty nine percent to seventy five percent. And um, there is a large increase that is planned in the infrastructure, whether it's highways um, or uh, uh, metro, urban infrastructure, road, um, uh, railways, highways, uh, and uh, inland waterways and things like that. And so these are the broad contours. Now, I mean, in other words, with all the apprehension that I have, I think this is the best that only anybody could have done. And I think this is one of the one of the good the budgets in that sense of the term. Uh, the intentions are good, but we will have to now see that you know the implementation. In fact, we are all good at creating things, you know, sort of announcing things, but it is the implementation that matters. And we hope they will be able to implement. And any failure to implement these is going to to is not going to. We are not going to realize what is said. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. That is indeed very enlightening because uh, we were struggling to understand a lot of figures which were thrown up by the budget. And we now realize it's not that simple that when we talk about an increase in health expenditure and so on, you don't quite realize that a lot of it has to come from the states. Uh, a number of questions arise. There are questions also being put by our members. But I'd like to start with one basic question. And I would also like to request you to, for the benefit of all of us, some of us may not be familiar with economic uh, terminology. Uh, the difference between what you said was the primary deficit and the overall fiscal deficit. Uh, yeah, let me, let me clarify that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, let me, let, you know, the. The government receives revenues, current revenues, by way of taxes and non-tax revenues. And the government also spends on wages and salaries, goods and services, subsidies, transfers, interest payments, and things like that, the current expenditure. So one is called the revenue receipts, and the other one is called the revenue expenditure. The difference between the two is called the revenue deficit. Okay, now the difference between the revenue expenditure that you incur for maintenance and basically running the government system and the, the revenue receipts that you get there of taxes and non-taxes and things like that. Then what happens is that the next thing that the government does is it borrows. Since the expenditures have to be incurred, you know, you, you know obviously the revenue receipts are not enough to, to meet the revenue expenditure itself. In addition to that, it has to incur capital expenditures. So it so revenue expenditure and the capital expenditure is the total expenditure. Now, however, you know, in terms of the revenues, it has the revenue receipts it is done. It also sells some of its asset, as I said, public sector enterprises uh, shares itself. 
and that's called non debt capital receipt so you add that back so revenue receipt plus this proceeds from the sale of enterprises now the total expenditure minus this minus this this uh, total receipts is the amount of money you are required to borrow and that is called the fiscal deficit when you say fiscal deficit you are basically saying that this is the amount of money we are required to borrow there will be some minor things like is it changes in the stock etc etc you know you know but then broadly that is what is called so the total expenditure minus the total revenue receipt plus um, non debt capital receipt is the fiscal deficit now in this fiscal deficit you will also see that part of you know this you know this fiscal deficit in basically includes the total you know it also includes some part of the deficit which has arisen because of the past lending and because of the past lending what you have to do is the interest payments so this fiscal part of the fiscal deficit is the interest payments now if you say that you know if you remove that what is the own deficit of this year you know taking away this legacy part that means then fiscal deficit minus the interest payment and that is the primary deficit that means that this is this is the deficit i have incurred for myself for this year you know forgetting about what the past what the, <laughs> so this is so the debt debt dynamics equation says that if your primary deficit is zero that means if you don't do any deficit yourself this year you know for forget about the past i mean the only deficit that you have is the interest payment from the past is the primary deficit is zero then so long as your growth rate of the economy is faster than the interest effective interest rate that you pay then you know your debt will not increase because every you know debt, these are all divided by the gdp so if the primary deficit to gdp ratio is zero if the if your interest payments that means interest you know effective interest rate and then growth rate of the economy gdp growth rate you know then you know you know then debt debt to gdp ratio will not increase that basically the idea so primary deficit so this this i hope it's clarified yeah. yeah thank you thank you very much indeed just one more question from my side mm -hmm. uh, the disinvestment target of 175000 crores uh, which seems to be ambitious if one looks at the record of the last year uh, which was just just about one third of what was targeted uh, if that does not come through as some people fear uh, and there is a further shortage of uh, receipts and on the other hand governments attempts to trim expenditure uh, by way of subsidies now there is a cut of uh, an expected cut in fertilizer subsidy of about 40% food subsidy petroleum subsidy these things if they are not politically feasible uh, as may well they may well be in which case the overall expenditure would not come down very much receipts will not will fall short of expectations and in that case the budget deficit may be more than what has been estimated will that not generate uh, inflationary pressures that have not been anticipated let me uh, put the matter this way now um, you know the government will have to come and with an amended fiscal responsibility and budget management act now that fiscal responsibility and budget management act will have to give the glide path for reduce the fiscal deficit from next year onwards now this year they have said that is budget budget deficit is somewhere about 6.4% of 6.8% of gdp in the budget speech finance minister has also said that is by 2025 26 she will reduce the fiscal deficit to 4% of gdp now the the uh, no she will reduce the fiscal deficit to 4.5% of gdp and actually the finance commission has given the glide path if it, it was asked to give recommend make a recommendation on the fiscal uh, fiscal consolidation path and it said that by 2526 the union government will have to reduce the fiscal deficit by 
which basically implies that she has not accepted their recommendation. You know, because she has already pegged it at higher level. But whatever be the case, she has to work out the, the consolidation path from 2022-23 onwards. For, for this, you know, um, and then obviously she will also have to lay down what she is going to do. In fact, from 2021-22 onwards, she has to lay down what the fiscal deficit numbers would be. And then this has to, you know, and then she'll have to come to the parliament and tell the, to the parliament if, you know, if there is a change, she has to tell them, you know, give an explanation to the parliament why there has been a change. This is the formal issue. On the specific issue that you mentioned, you know, the, they're hoping that uh, they will be able to, since last year, they were not able to do this disinvestment. There is a large part of the disinvestment they had hoped to, to get from LIC, you know, by, by selling the shares of uh, LIC. Large part, by, substantial part of it from, you know, Bharat Petroleum uh, Limited. Um, so they will, they are supposed to, and then they are hoping that they will be able to get it. You are correct in saying that in the past, in the past so many years, not just last year, so many years, the disinvestment targets have not been achieved. But there is a hope that, you know, I mean, for example, they mean, you know, sort of, there's a, you know, they might come out with the action plan since, since they could not do it. Possibly everything is accumulated and they might come up with the action plan in the first part of the year itself. That's what they say. And, you know, we will have to wait and see. But you are right that there can be shortfalls. And, there may be you, 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 there may also be a political pressure to increase the subsidies, as you mentioned. There are two possibilities open. One is the 26% increase in the capital expenditures that is shown will be com compressed. What happens in, the, in, the, in our system is capital expenditures is always a residual. You know, you always, you know, you, you, you know, you know, you get a, when the budget is presented, you get a feel good factor. Oh, there is so much of capital expenditure. But during the course of the year, you know, sort of, you know, if the things don't work out, you basically reduce capital expenditure and then, you know, sort of, you know, sort of re, re uh, work and then spend, continue to spend. The other possibility is that the fiscal deficit may go up. There is a, so there are both the possibilities are open. Now, consequence of that, as I said, will depend upon if the economy picks up. You see, what happens is that the, the, this 6.8% that I talked about fiscal deficit is the amount of money that the government is required to borrow. In addition to that, the government, at the state government level, they will have to borrow, they will, they, they will be borrowing about 4% of GDP. So in the process, what happens somewhere about 11% of the, of, of the money that is available in the, in the financial system will be borrowed. How do they do it? There is this statutory liquidity ratio, which is requiring the banks to keep 18% of their demand and time liabilities in government securities. And this is the way they go about. Now, now when, now where does the money come from? Money comes from you and me. The household sector's financial saving. You see, there are, there is a corporate sector. There is a government sector. There is a household sector. Corporate sector would need more money to borrow for their own investments. The government obviously is not a surplus sector, it is a deficit sector, as we say, you know, 6.9% plus another 4%. And it is only the household sector which has a surplus because it doesn't invest as much as it, uh, it saves. So the total household sector and also part of the saving is in, in uh, you know, physical assets like land and gold and things. Household sector financial saving was 7.6%, but last, you know, last year it might have increased because of the precautionary motive. And because there was no opportunity for you to spend because there, people could not go on holidays. And we could not spend on things because there was lockdown. So, so the, the, in other words, this year there may not be much of a problem because corporate sector was also not borrowing. And the government the, and, the, and the household sector had a surplus, you know, much more savings. But next year, I mean, in fact, before that, household sector financial saving was just about 7.6%. 
so if you know if you take 7.6% and if you go on you know if you go something like 10 to 11% by for government then obviously there is a pressure and that pressure could translate itself into higher prices i mean this is the way it happens but but what what is likely to happen is that you see there may not be pick up very fast this year the private sector may not be really demanding now what the government has been doing is that whenever there is a pressure it does a backdoor uh, sort of a thing you actually is done by the reserve bank what happens when the government borrows more and when the corporates also more interest rates have to go up because it's the same level of saving in order to prevent the interest the government has to borrow at lower rate of interest because they want to what that's called the financial repression they want to contain the they want to force you know lower rate of interest so what the reserve bank of india does is that you know it keeps you know what it does is you have the government securities you know it has a host of government securities it simply sells off these securities and this is called the open market operation and when you sell off these securities and you know what happens is um, no what happens is that at that time government actually purchases these securities from the banks from the banks because the bank are the ones which has the government security when it purchases the securities it actually issues new currency so in other words indirect monetization of the deficit is taking place in fact this year the amount of monetization works out to somewhere about 3 and 1/2 lakh crore and if you really go on increasing in increasing the monetization you know of the deficit you know indirect saying that oh liquidity is the problem you know earlier we used to directly monetize now after 1996 they stopped it now indirectly we do this so if the money supply is much more and the economy doesn't pick up then there will be inflation depression i'm sorry for a long answer but then there were no so it's ultimately uh, means printing of fresh currency absolutely and putting that is it the, in the system. that is that yeah. <laughs> and inflation <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right yeah now may i throw it open to the to the members whoever would like to ask a question please unmute yourself it's open to you the floor is all yours and uh, i mean any any question we are all we are not economists we are all laymen so but here is an opportunity hello uh, hi yeah. good evening please come in hello yes, yes come yes, in yes. yeah you are um both the railway budget how it has been incorporated into the main budget uh, this year is that bala subramanian sata na yes, or jai or jaiswal railway finances how it has been balanced with the main budget see actually this uh, in, you know sort of assimilation of the railway budget in the in the in the main budget has happened something like 3 4 4, four years ago hmm. and um, you know what they have done is basically the whatever is the you know the whatever is the revenue um, they take it in the receipt separately expenditure they take it they net it out revenue and expenditure and separately provide for the capital expenditure and then of course give give a very detailed analysis of the demand for grants for the railways so that is how they have incorporated that I, I i'll just take five seconds if there is somebody there i just one minute one half a minute yeah. they have assimilated this in railway budget into the main budget itself and the details will be available with the railway ministry because it's that you know the you know sort of um obviously the revenues are not taken the revenues and expenditures are netted out and then taken on you taken into the into the system yeah why i asked was during this period of corona railways were the most affected and the common man could had to use other transports so when the law court has been lifted how do they make up the system of public transport that is why my question was prompted no in fact you see during corona both uh, railways and uh, roadways but the roadways is basically the state's responsibility it doesn't really uh, you know come into the main budget 
So basically what they have done is this will be shown as a deficit which is separately kept out. And then obviously, you know, sort of, um, uh, you know, it's made through the borrowing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Sandeep, just for as a question, uh, hold on, hold, hold, hold on. Uh, there is someone else in the queue. Yeah, Sandeep Jaiswal, he, he wanted to ask a question. Yeah, uh, hello. Come I'm in, come in. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, at the end of your uh, talk, uh, you said this is the best they could have done, and the intention is good. And the implementation is the key. So what kind of challenges might come during implementation? Thank you. The, there can be many you know, issues of implementation. One is uh, the political economy factors. As was already said, whether we will be able to really reduce the, the deficit, uh, reduce the subsidy um, and transfers. And um, during the course of the year, what are the additional demands that will come through? whether we will be able to really do the disinvestment and privatization as we have planned because that's a very that's a key because 2 point, 1 point 7, you know, 7, 5, 175,000 crores is not a small amount of money so whether we will be able to do that how effectively you know all these reforms can be really carried out basically the assets restructuring company what sort of a reform are you going to put through into the commercial, into public sector banks uh, in order to improve their governance in the system? How are you going to distance, how is the government going to distance itself, distance itself from, the, from the management of the various banks? Because you have, you have all sorts of problems with government ownership. Because, you know, there is a phone banking, now you don't have phone banking, but there is a, you know, there, there is a allocation saying that MS should, MSME should be given this much, you know, 50,000 crore credit. The agriculture should be given 16,000 crore credit. I mean, for commercial decisions, you don't decide. It has to be the commercial, it has to be the commercial decision. In other words, government interference and then lending decisions will have to go. How exactly are you going to do it? I mean, this, and again, Creation of um, the 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 investment company, um, you know, for uh, long term uh, lending, and how we are, you know, how this is going to happen. They have also talked about you know, the creation of uh, uh, something like uh, some reforms in the higher education, and actually abolishing the university grants commission and bringing about the national higher education commission. Now. What is likely to happen? Whether uh, you know, sort of this, they can carry this out or not. These are some of the questions that uh, we have. So, implementing is, you know, I mean, they actually announced the agricultural, um, you know, reform policies um, without um, going through the rigmarole of detailed discussions. Now they are facing the problem. You see, the political economy is not that easy in this country. They they have realized it. Now they are facing the problem which cannot be implemented. So we will have to see how exactly they will go about doing this. At this stage, at this stage, I would request Dr. Krishna to come in and say hello to Dr. Rao. Dr. Krishna. Uh, yeah. Hello, Professor Krishna. How are you? <laughs> you know. Oh, fine, very yeah. fine. You're you know, meeting after a long time. I'm really grateful to you for accepting the invitation and coming and giving an excellent uh, presentation. I think uh, it's being appreciated by everyone. You are very insightful and informative. I think you have come to the level of the layman as you as you wanted, but uh, covered all the aspects in, in considerable detail. Um, in fact, this is my first week in uh, Atashri when Dr. Raja asked me about the about the, this Saturday meeting. I immediately thought of you and approached you. I am grateful to you for accepting the invitation and taking the trouble of preparing a very good uh, presentation. Of course, for you this is this is very child's play, but for us all of us it is a, a delightful experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Professor Krishna, you know, you have been a teacher, you, you know, we have learned so much from you and we always look forward to your guidance. 
and um, obviously anything that we speak uh, any good thing if we speak that goes to you and any bad things if we do <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm not responsible <laughs> and i was uh, telling just before you i agree <laughs> and thank raja that raja also to bring making this possible and uh, i think the very first day of my stay in atashri he mentioned this and immediately i thought of you and uh, it's very very very, very present experience i think we all appreciate your your uh, uh, work and yeah thank you no i was telling that uh, the lecture that i delivered in mids when you know that foundation lecture on uh, public finance you yeah. know so sort of when you you are the chairman you know that has eventually i have developed into a book which should be coming out in the next 3 months yeah. it's called reflections on indian public finance oxford is publishing that oxford university press is is publishing that so i think that you know from there you know from that the lecture that i did with the mids eventually i brought you know sort of expanded it into a book that's what i was telling him i'm so happy to see this interaction between two old friends and uh, i in fact this is the first time that dr krishna is attending our conversations i hope you will now be able to get us many more speakers like dr rao and uh, be able to help us i was reading about dr krishna the other day and uh, what his told many of his students had to say about him uh, you know every one of them and i have, i have i read names like onkar goswami um, persons like ramachandra guha kaushik basu writing about him and all of them talk every one of them talk about his humility and uh, some of them had also mentioned about coming into the class and lecturing for years without any notes in hand and uh, i mean when one read all that one was really inspired and i'm so happy that such a person as uh, he is one of us in atashri so welcome formally welcome to atashri although now, you come now, I, now in this connection i want to say something you know there was a book that was um, edited in his honor and then the editor when they it was edited and there was a, there is an event of releasing the book and obviously very eminent people went on saying that oh professor krishna was my teacher professor krishna was my teacher and everybody you know sort of you know sort of talking about the glorious days and the 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 level of the, you know sort of understanding they received from him and then came the turn of monte kagluwalia monte kagluwalia said that no professor krishna i can't say he was my teacher but he was my teacher in law <laughs> <laughs> because he, you see he was you know isher was the one who had taken the lead in isher alwalia was the one who taken the lead in mm. sort of or, you know getting this uh, yes. book in his honor yes. so i i remember that when you mentioned <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you can we take in a couple of more questions sure or? sure sure yeah. and uh, okay uh, i believe someone want, wanted to ask a question want to come in please Let's come in yeah yeah uh, you can't see your face yeah can you now yeah uh, come in uh yeah, now no? we can now we can yes yeah yeah uh, good evening and thanks for an excellent lecture my question is very nice will we ever have a surplus budget well i don't think we will ever have a surplus budget you know in a lighter vein you know it's you know finance ministers are not like housewives in fact, in fact housewives are the best at best finance ministers they know how to, they know what prudence is and then actually manage the household uh, expenses in a prudent manner but then finance ministers don't have that incentive to do so so we will never have a surplus budget but then given the fact that the expenditure requirements are so much and so you do need to really borrow but what is important is that you borrow in such a manner that you borrow to create certain assets you know just as you know you have to in a, as a householder you have to borrow to create have a house 
or borrow to have a car or something like that. Mm. No, with the hope that you will have the rate of return on the money that you use enough to pay back the loan. So basically, when you say that the debt should not increase, we should really contain and reduce the debt over a period of time. It's basically meaning that you borrow for those for creating those assets which will generate a rate of return. Thank you. And to create a better economy, isn't it better to create jobs than giving freebies by the government? Absolutely. But then you know, you know there are there are two things that um, have to be done. It's always better to uh, better to create uh, better to create infrastructure facilities, economic activities, so that jobs can be created. Yeah. That is one of the important things. Yeah. How, however, you know there are some people who are absolutely poor. They don't have the second meal tomorrow. Now, in that case. You know, you don't, as a civilized society, we don't allow them to die. Yeah. And therefore, some immediate relief will have to be done. You see, markets don't do redistribution. The redistribution has to be done by the government. So nobody will, you know, sort of, so obviously government will have to come. So when people are in a very bad situation, and you may have to really do, bring about some amount of social security for those people, old, um, and then, of course, uh, destitute and you know, you know, extremely poor people and all that. But it's always better to empower the people. In fact, instead of making redistribution, it's better to give them education, healthcare, yes. school, and then so that they can they can get better jobs. As they say, it's better to teach fishing than giving. Absolutely, absolutely. And another thing I noticed is the gap between the rich people and the poor people and government. Yeah, no, I mean, this, no, the gap between the rich and the poor will continue to rise. That's not um, because the rich man has more capital and he, he, will, he will make more capital out of the capital. Mm -hmm. But the question is, by you know, the, we need to really look at whether by reducing the incomes of the rich, can we increase the incomes of the poor? No, no, increase the income of the poor. And we, do need, we, need to, we need those people who can create jobs. Yeah. We know we need to, them to we need to have them incentive to create jobs, and so that you see the poor people can take those jobs and do things, and obviously the government has to take more money from those rich people so that they can also it can also do it. But you know that when people used to think that the government is um, is a benevolent uh, you know it's a benevolent it is always looking for the welfare, but if you really look at it very carefully. Do the do all the government its actions? Do they really increase the welfare of the people, or does it increase the welfare of the bureaucracy or the politician? Well, we come to the last question yeah. of the evening, Kiran Nanda. Kiran Nanda. Papa. Yeah, come in. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Uh, please hold on. There's one other person in the queue, Kiran Nanda. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. You have any question? Okay, Mrs. Lavkare, come in. Yeah, um, well, it was uh, very well presented, uh, Mr. Rao. Uh, however, a lay person like me who doesn't have an economic background, I may be asking questions which uh, may not uh, come to your expectation. One question, was... one question. Oh, only one question. Okay. Yeah, the last question. Oh, 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 oh my God. Now, I... <laughs> I just, <laughs> I'm, I'm baffled. I don't know which question I should ask you. You, you decide. But, uh, but you know, uh, but, uh, has the budget, uh, budget made provisions for raising resources to meet the increasing expenditure of the sectors? And uh, has it made any provision for 
uh, for improving uh, the job employment opportunities for women. For women, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Any now, special programs for women? Yeah. Job. Now, um, see, on the issue of raising resources, there are no new taxes. Oh. But then they are taking into account a little more of non-tax revenue from various dividends and then, you know, sort of things like that. But my most important thing is, you know, they're, they're taking uh, something like 1.75 lakh crores by way of selling off uh, public sector enterprises. You know, the, what, they, what they call the disinvestment, the asset monetization. There are also, there, there are also a lot of discussion on you know, sort of how they, they have to do asset monetization in the various companies, but not in the budget proper. See, for example, National Highway Authority of India selling certain segments of the roads to, to the private sector for collecting the tolls and, you know, and, and similar, similar other operations. So other than that, there are no new taxes. Of course, there is 1% on, um, on the on the existing uh, uh, taxes and that is for creating agricultural infrastructure. On the second question, on creating, um, sort of improving the job em or employment opportunities, I don't think there is any special program for women. Okay. Uh, Father Matthew, would you like to say a few words? Father Matthew. Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor uh, Govindrao, for uh, your uh, stunning and fabulous analysis um, of the present budget. Um, one thing you are uh, saying that this is one of the best budgets in the last uh, several years. And another one uh, as a takeaway, I see that uh, you were explaining when uh, the market forces are failing, uh, the government has to come in. As we know very well that the government, uh, the, the market forces are uh, based on uh, their uh, profit making. And sometimes it can go uh, to the extent of a greed. Uh, so therefore, in which way the government can come in so that uh, they can support the ordinary person, the citizens who might be uh, 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 affected by the market forces and their livelihood are to a certain extent uh, curtailed. So could you just give us a Yeah, no, more? in fact, you see, you know, there is a basic thing like providing a law and order, ensuring property rights, ensuring, and, you know, sort of enforcing contracts. I mean, these are the basic thing that the government has to do anyway, because without that, you know, the society doesn't uh, work. Or, you know, if there is no incentive for savings, investment, and uh, or growth if you don't ensure property rights, if you don't, if you don't, uh, ensure safety and security of the people, et cetera, et cetera. That is what, is what we in economics call the basic public good. Then there are some things, but there are a lot of externalities, you know, highways, roadways, you know, where the private benefits, the social benefits are much higher than the private benefits. So the government can come and then either, you know, you know, so make sure that this adequate things are provided by, through various various um, inducements or it has to possibly you know, produce it itself, that second. But then the point that you are saying that the you know, private sector has agreed. Indeed, private sector has agreed. Now, just as the private public sector doesn't, is not always altruistic because there is always a politician and a bureaucrat who is trying to maximize his own gains there. But nevertheless, private sector has, does have a need because the private sector exists to make profits. Now the question is whether this profit is made in a legitimate manner or by you know sort of creating problems for others. These are the things that has to be seen. That is the reason why you need to really have a strong regulation. That is the reason why you need a competition commission. That is the reason why you need to really have a you know sort of you know somebody who is basically looking at banks and then regulating them to see that depositors' money is safe. So now what has happened is that you see, you thought that, oh, so the private sector is making a lot of profit in five-star hotels. So let, let us start the five-star hotels. 
So the government doesn't have the capacity to start a five-star hotel and run because the incentive doesn't exist because the fellow running a five-star hotel is not bothered about because in any case the money is it's a common money. So, so you need to really see that is the reason why you know to see where the market fails, what is the nature of the market failure. Say for example, the private sector doesn't do redistribution; it doesn't care for the poor. Now, in fact, there is a beautiful article by Mansell Olson, one of the great public choice theorists, where he talks about the 19th century Chinese war law in China. China, where there were a, the China was infested with the aye, roving bandits. Aye, aye. Listen, China was infested with roving bandits, and in that situation, there was no incentive to save, incentive to invest, aye, incentive to grow. Aye. At that aye. time, one of the roving, one of the the strong bandits told the people that, look, I will protect you from other bandits, but you should give me a constant share of your income. And people gave that money to him, it's a protection money. And so obviously the incentives developed to save in a, So from rolling banditry, you moved into a stationary bandit. But the stationary bandit had no incentive to look after the poor. And that is the reason why you get into a democracy where in that, basically poor also have to be looked after. They are also human beings. So there is, so the point that I'm trying to make is the government should see where it's where it has to do and it has to do it well. You know, if the government said that I will run BSNL, MTNL, now, I mean, the technology is not, you know, sort of has advanced so much that, and then you see, nobody bothers about the BSNL, BSNL and MTNL. And then what happens? Government, the, it says that I will give 30,000 crores of taxpayers money to look after the BSNL, MTNL. And all. That is not the way. So you need to see where the market fails and control the private sector to, pre to, preventing, to prevent it from predatory competition and so that it's a competition is fair. You know, they don't do abnormal profits, they don't do monopoly profits and then, you know, that is the reason why you need to come and control. So, you know, that is the reason why you have competition commission, you are the Bank of India, you have many other institutions. Thank you so much. Splendid explanation, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, I and I'm sure a lot of others have plenty of questions in hand, but time would not permit us to take them on. Uh, may I request uh, Reverend Sukumar to propose a vote of thanks? Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Rao. Sir, it's, a, it's been, been a pleasure. A... It's a pleasure talking to you all because. And one of the, the persons said that her um, question may not be she's the lay person. I think these are the most important questions. And I like yeah. I really appreciate the questions, yes. uh, questions that have been yeah. uh, you know sort of put. We'd like to have you again sometime later. Sure, sure. When you're free. Any, anytime. Yes. yes, thank you. Yeah, sir Reverend Sukuma. Sir Dr. M. Govindarao. On behalf of Ecumenical Christian Center and Atosri, with immense gratitude, with a profound respect, we're extremely delighted to know you and your massive wealth of knowledge. In fact, we are fortunate to have you with us. After looking at your biodata, we were curious to know more about you and your analysis on the topic, the union budget and analysis for the layman. Though you have global reputation, after your presentation, I come to know that you are down to earth. Your presentation was simple, yet it was a brilliant analysis. Your presentation also thought provoking. In fact, it was an electrifying session. Thank you for exploring multiple layers of the economic dimensions during COVID-19. Human tragedy, especially in the light of migrant laborers, issues related with the commercial tax, issues related with the role of corporates, revenue collections, growth of GDP. Thank you very much indeed for unpacking how budget was irrelevant, also more relevant with the comparative analysis with 2018 and 19. Challenges to revive economy, role of public administration, importance of national policy fund, role of finance commission, 
yes, as you say, there is a need to raise tax revenues, especially as the government is providing vaccine distribution. Thanks a lot for explaining three major categories of the budget, consolidated public account and contingency. It is amazing to know four profound dynamic reforms of the union budget. Really? This budget He's my teacher, so reforms with the good intentions indeed, so that the common people can be benefited. Thank you very much indeed, sir. We also extend our profound gratitude to Professor KCR Raja, also the director of Equipment Education Center, Professor Father Matthew Chandran Kunel, also Deputy Director Tanmindun Vepe for organizing an amazing and brilliant online event. Thank you very much indeed. That brings this meeting to an end. I might mention here that we've had a number of uh, uh, invitees from outside Bangalore, from Bombay, from Delhi, even one of our friends in New Jersey. Uh, and uh, uh, nine of my friends from the Rotary Club of Bangalore. Uh, so it's been a very, very enjoyable evening. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Thank you. You have been Thank very you. kind. Thank you very much. Yes, Menlun. You're calling it a day. <laughs>